Namaste and welcome to Chitti Media's Current Affairs show. Today I have with us Omer Ghazi. Namaste, Omer. Welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. Such a pleasure and honor. And I would uh, start first by congratulating uh, all the Indians, all the scientists, everybody involved in the project at this amazing achievement. Uh, that has put a mark on the global stage. So that is one achievement that um, the dreams of uh, Homi J. Bhabha, Vikram Sarabhai, A.P. Abdul Kalam, and everybody have uh, come to fruition. So I think that is uh, remarkable. Now, uh, let's get, by getting uh, it out of the way, coming to the question, uh, there is a lot of reaction on why this um, point is called Shiv Shakti. And uh, the one point was also called Tiranga. So I, I think, uh, of course, whenever something good happens, you know, there is always some sort of reaction uh, from the society. And by reacting, people tell about themselves by their judgment, what they are made of, where they are coming from. When we say we, are, we have named uh, the point Shiv Shakti, I think there cannot be any better name for, for that point because when we're talking about scientific advancements. India as a country has had a rich tradition of science and spirituality intertwined with each other. Right. There was no uh, like the separation of church and state like in the West. So there was no they were not at loggerheads like that. So when we we talk about scientific exploration, we're talking about uh, advancing the human civilization, the human consciousness. So science and uh, spirituality go hand in hand together. Now, when it comes to Shiv Shakti specifically, a lot of people will have uh, certain misconceptions that we are talking about only one particular Hindu deity, perhaps, or we are talking uh, some majoritarian uh, majoritarianism is happening and, you know, somebody is in danger and there is some agenda behind this. The reality is that when you study deeply, the Shiv Shakti is nothing but the names of two fundamental forces of nature which are universal. When we're talking about uh, day and night, we're talking about energy and matter, we're talking about plus and minus. So these energies are existing in tandem with each other ev everywhere. So that is called Shiv Shakti. And when we have moved such a, uh, at such a huge advancement, so we are saying that we respect that energy, we acknowledge that energy, we bow down to that energy and uh, that is the respect that we have paid to, by naming that point. So I think it is uh, a lot of, I would say, misunderstanding and lack of knowledge, perhaps, about our own culture. That is why the, that is the reason that these um, reactions are coming. So that is my view on that. Beautifully explained, Omer. Uh, I know that you are also into philosophy a lot, and you, despite you know, uh, in fact, with your complementing your. Uh, background your uh, you know you you're a part of the minority community but uh, i have seen your work and i know that you're drawn to the vedic culture and the vedic philosophy so i can see parts of that kind of seeping into your answer uh, moving on so recently you know the modi government has just announced a 200 rupees of uh, Thing, like a subsidy on LPG cylinders in India. Do you think that India's vibrant foreign policy with the UAE and the Middle East has played any role in this? Yeah, this is um, the, the Raksha Bandhan gift that the government has announced uh, 200 rupees are, are slashed. Uh, of course, it's a welcome step. Uh, especially for the marginalized people, uh, section of people, uh, for them it, it's a it's a huge uh, thing. And of course, the prices have been fluctuating a lot now in recent years, so it has been an issue. Uh, but connecting it to the India's foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis UAE and Middle East, I think it's a little more complex than that. Uh, when you look at India-UAE relations, uh, especially if you're talking about uh, the oil trade, that oil trade has actually gone up and India has had a very good relation with UAE with respect to that. Uh, only in the year 2021, the oil trade was around $9 billion. And in 2022, it almost doubled. That was It, it come, came to almost $18 billion. So yeah, there is a, a 
increase or growth in india ua relations also you mentioned middle east uh, yes india has been uh, in you know a great trading partner of the middle east and india has been a huge market but apart from middle east what is important to notice here is that russia is competing with the middle east when it comes to indian markets uh, especially after uh, that ukraine war one uh, welcome step by the government was that we refused to bow down to the cold war era binary that they have divided the world into and as our external affairs minister dr s j shankar has also said that we refuse to play by that binary that you are you are supporting you united nation uh, united states or or the ussr or, or the russia so we have, we, we fail to uh, we refuse to bow down to that binary so so russia has also been uh, supplying uh, gas and oil uh, to indian markets so that has also uh, helped in decreasing the fluctuation of the oil prices but at the same time a lot more needs to be done at the same time because when it comes to this subsidy the poor people will be getting on 200 rupees less but when you see the prices have actually not gone down right the government has to bear uh, that subsidy for the next year and it comes to around 7000 crores so the government has to bear it so i think uh, something more needs to be done on the front of the oil trade whether it's with uae uh especially with uae because uh, we are planning to increase our trade to our almost you know uh, oil trade and non oil trade to almost 100 billion dollars in 20 by 2030 so when that happens maybe the prices will come down even more for the indian markets what are your views on the export of water and import of oil that that whole uh, importing oil and exporting water that kind of trade exchange because that although we want more oil to come in from of course uae and the middle east nations but at the same time there is a section of people who question the idea of uh, exporting water and importing trade in exchange for it so what are your views on that that is actually uh, quite tricky when it comes to fresh water reserves we when we talking about non oil trade and uh, exporting water like you said and importing oil the, a lot of apprehensions that people have are valid first of all because uh, when it comes to india we have almost 1/5 of the world's population right almost 18% of the population but the fresh water reserve reserves are only around 4 to 5% that we have so there is a lot of disparity uh, so we do not have uh, uh, extra uh, water per se that we can export uh, keeping that in mind when we're talking about export water and import oil it is not just water we are talking about that term is usually used uh, for non oil trade basically if you are exporting rice for example uh, india exported around 35 lakh tons of uh, basmati rice to ua for example so how much water was uh, used in that farming that will be calculated as export water and import oil so that is the basic i would say definition uh, yeah so i think of course india is rich in resources uh, there is no denying the fact and uh, when it comes to agriculture and farming you know 70% of our population is still into farming and agriculture we have a lot of uh farming and res- uh, resources so but we need to be careful that our uh, basic needs are met uh the prices are not going up beyond a certain value uh, for our own population and then we can simultaneously talk about energy needs so that balance needs to be uh, reached and uh, our government is uh, working with the uae for example like you said 50 billion dollar the trade has reached so that is part of that export water and oil, import oil trade only the non oil bilateral trade the non yes and we have also signed a, a, a comprehensive economic uh, you know cepa yes partnership CEPA. agreement cepa yes. yeah yeah uh, so i think that was in 20 uh, 22 22 yes so that was a milestone because that 
not only opens our market to uh, goods it also open our markets to services so a lot of you know indians will be finding their employment there uh, in service sector in telecom uh, also as laborers as in the textiles jewelry what not so that was a trademark so uh, earlier as well sorry wasn't that happening earlier as well it was it was but that uh, was not up to the uh, standards that we wanted because when we're talking about that we have to increase our trade to almost 100 billion dollars so more of these mous will be signed only then we can it, it happens in several stages suddenly of course we can't reach a huge milestone so it happens in different stages so i think that 2022 uh, pact was quite a milestone and we are looking forward to milestones like that in the near future coming back to space exploration since we just started talking about that now there is again there is a section of people who are criticizing india for investing in space exploration at a time when people in general are dipped in poverty illiteracy etc can you lend us some perspective on this what are your views on this like i said when something happens there are always reactions uh, but this question is a lot more deeper than that <laughs> uh it's it is actually a rhetorical question and it when you look at the surface the question is quite meaningless right yeah. it uh because it is not an either or situation yeah it's not uh that you have to first feed a certain section of people or yeah yeah because that is never going to happen you are never going to reach a certain stage where you think okay now i think we are uh, ready for a space exploration both the things will have to work in tandem with each other right uh, but where does this uh, thought process come from this uh, question does not exist in a vacuum so there are two answers to this the one thought process comes from the west from the colonial powers from the imperial powers who are still in that hangover that how can india a nation that was we left in tatters back in 1947 how can it reach the moon literally no so they always raise this you know you, you must be aware and our viewers must be aware that how that uh, british uh, news anchor made an issue out of it that we yeah. uh, we need that aid back and everything so that thought process comes from there and yeah. that uh, so this is an answer to those powers that yes india is very much capable Uh, to uh, reach these milestones and we will not wait for anybody's approval before doing something so that is one the second thought process comes from uh, the country itself it is it has been fed to us through textbooks it has been fed to us through uh, political theories that the resources first belong to a certain section and someone who is Uh, reaching the moon or going for a space exploration or uh, meeting new heights that needs to be condemned you know instead of the poor going to the rich you know poor becoming rich the rich should be becoming poor there is this uh, ideology you know a, a lot of uh, you know that that communist mindset so i think a lot of it comes from that communist mindset also uh that you know first do this we have to first attain equality in the financial equality economic equality then we should talk about uh, scientific exploration that doesn't work so i think both these uh, ideologies and thought processes do not have any place uh, in a society that needs advancement it needs progress and by making these uh, progress and uh, advancements we are also going to facilitate uh the poor people also how for example chandrayaan let's talk about chandrayaan the it, it's not just a power statement that okay we can do we can land on chand we can land on the moon it's not just a power statement chandrayaan 3 is the first one to land on the lunar south pole and we are looking for hydrogen on lunar water that can be harvested to make electricity without radioactive pollution that is the scientific background 
So if we have electricity through nuclear ways, without radioactive pollution, who is who is it going to benefit? The common people, right? So things are more complex than that. So I think we, we should not pay attention to all these uh, reactions and uh, you know keep achieving the, uh, these milestones as much as possible. That's a very good point that you raised. I mean, uh, this was something that we wanted to touch upon that what exactly, yes, we've landed on the, you know, the South Pole of the Moon, but what exactly are the benefits of this achievement for the common people? Uh, moving on, recently, since, you know, you yourself have a, a background in culture, so I want to talk about this, that... Uh, Music, art, culture and wellness festivals are being organized a lot these days in um, Saudi Arabia in a bit to promote moderate Islam, right? The Crown Prince's uh, lead has inspired many of his close associates and comp compatriots to initiate a reformation movement to convert the stereotype Islam into a moderate, vibrant and inclusive Islam. So do you see the more radical uh, Muslim nations following suit as they generally do with respect to Saudi? Mohammed bin Salman, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, he has uh, been a breath of fresh air, uh, uh, I dare say, uh, when it comes to the kingdom's policies, uh, when it comes to women's rights, when it comes to inclusivity and uh, overall progress, he has made some remarkable changes within the kingdom at least uh, talking about culture uh, first within the kingdom uh, there is a growing interest in yoga number one uh, there is a growing uh, there is a woman uh, no fal maravi uh, in saudi arabia who has been instrumental in uh, legalizing yoga and promoting it within the kingdom so that is one good example uh, when it comes to music so uh, indian soft power uh, through bollywood has played a huge yeah. role in promoting that inclusivity. A lot of Arabs uh, in UAE and Saudi Arabia, they have a um, quite a thing for Bollywood. You know, Shah Rukh Khan and everybody, they're they are quite big yeah. there. So, uh, but when it comes to uh, other countries who are following suit to uh, Saudi Arabia, yeah. uh, the change is not as much as we would like to see. Ah, when it comes to Qatar, when it comes to Bahrain, uh, you know, there we, we see that that change is not coming at a pace that it should have. So, there more needs to be done on that front. And maybe within the kingdom, Mohammed bin Salman is is one uh, person who believes in certain ideals and he's pushing for it. And among his associates, maybe we do not have someone like that in other countries. Uh, who should be so yes there are uh, certain examples of muslim majority secular moderate countries also Al albania kosovo uh, uh, sort of tunisia also tunisia is also a very good example uh, but some countries like uh, iran uh, some countries like qatar so i think we we need to see a lot more change and i hope that happens over time uh, so I think we can hope, only hope for that. Do you see it happening, that change? I mean, I think, yes. it from a very lay, lay person's uh, level, do you see it happening? Yes, I do. Uh, talking about Iran, for example, they, they, they were uh, the protest on hijab, yeah. right, L uh, last year only. Yeah. We saw that a lot of men uh, were participating in those protests and posting their pictures online on Instagram on Twitter uh, against the dictatorial you know regime. It was yeah. a statement, and it yeah. was not just hijab. It was basically uh, a statement of asserting their own identity. Yeah. So I think internet internet has been a, a great a mediator uh, of promoting these values because i think we fear things that we do not know about you know when we do not know about something we are not exposed so there are two feelings that arise either we fear it or we judge it there are only two reactions but when we are exposed to it over a certain period of time uh, through twitter through facebook through whatever social media 
we see that you know the rest of the world has reached certain at a certain stage and we are uh, stuck in certain medieval uh, you know primitive practices so of course you will feel feel like growing so i think uh, through internet the change is coming uh, the the um, arab spring also happened uh, it did not go anywhere uh, towards the end but it was also some uh, uh, wave of change within the middle east so let's see and let's hope that you know this this wave grows momentum and it uh, culminates in something so then but on one hand you have saudi arabia and on the other hand you have afghanistan saudi arabia is uh, trying to move towards a more liberal regime but you have afghanistan where little girls they are not even allowed basic rights of education of uh, proper clothing like uh, i was aghast honestly to see that recently that you know they're not even allowed to uh, show their full face or it's just a little tiny eyes you can see peeping out so what would you say is the basic uh, you know the the cause of this kind of disparity that you see in both these uh, nations or these groups of muslim nations i would say see this is the uh, primitive uh, medieval mindset i was talking about uh, a lot of countries every country has a different interpretation of uh, you know islam and everybody uh, insists that mine is the correct version and there is no end to this debate right it, it within a within a certain sect also you you have uh, all sort of regressive elements you have all sort of uh, uh, some progressive strands also coming out you know even within india you see different strands of thought when it comes to afghanistan afghanistan is a basically a test that has gone wrong what is the test the test by the united states and the nato to uh, make a statement against the ussr right but they did not know that they are playing with fire because they started radicalizing uh, the the local people with the help of uh, a radical interpretation now it does not mean that you know there is nothing that can be it is all interpretation and there is no problem in the text some people also uh, you know say that apologia and put the whole blame on the united states that is also not true there is some substance in the text which has uh, the possibility of being interpreted so violently and so radically so the, it was a mixture of two things at the same time and when it comes to afghanistan the regional uh, uh, conflict also plays a huge role you know when you zoom into it you know there is the hazaras there is the pashtuns you know taliban also have their different fractions and they keep fighting each other internal conflicts but everybody agrees on one on one thing all the factions we don't want to let women study like <laughs> why why is that right what, what what is yeah and it's not just about studying like you said they have to wear that thing you know it, it makes them uh, uh, you know completely lose their identity Human, completely inhuman. Yeah, inhuman. Uh, they are not visible. They are uh, their documentation. Their you know identity cards are not made. Sometimes, uh, you know, amusement parks. You are not allowed to go into amusement parks. It sounds trivial to us, but it is actually huge. Uh, you know, you have stripping them of their basic dignity. Basic human rights. Yes. Basic human rights. Basic dignity. Basic uh, their whole existence. is stripped yeah. off so yeah. and the way they treat their minority is the sikh minority is the hindu minorities you know they yeah. have to run away the the temples are desecrated the bamiyan buddhist statues are gone it's a yeah. it's a blood bath so yeah because it, the text has been interpreted so radically in that region that it has come out this violently and now they are saying that saudi arabia is not following true islam that is also a, a new one uh, because now they are saying that you know saudi arabia it is uh, having its ties with israel uh, and it is uh, 
uh, the UAE is having ties with Israel. They are recognizing Israel. So they are not true Muslims. So now Saudi Arabia is also not true Muslim. So it is a whole finger pointing game that is going on, but it has no end. So I think uh, so this is the two different strands of thought that we have to live with, basically. So basically, you're saying that it's just because of their own interpretations of Islam and each interpretation or, uh, you know, each uh, sect believes that they have the correct interpretation or they have the proper, the right interpretation. Exactly. So I, 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 w- I would also uh, add to that, of course, what is true Islam, what is correct Islam, nobody can has the complete authority over it, right? But whoever interprets it radically and violently faces its consequences at the same time, right? And whoever interprets it more progressively and liberally also bears its fruit. So I think it it depends on what you, uh, you know, how you want to take it. So that is all there is to it. It's very interesting. Normally, we hear such things about uh, Hinduism that, you know, Hinduism is so, uh, it is so open and it, it's so tolerant that everybody can have their own interpretation of Hinduism. And uh, you can have all schools of thought encompass into Hinduism. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you, you know, you've never really heard, at least I've never really heard of uh, this particular uh, line of thought that you just shared, that uh, that there are different interpretations to Islam as well. Because what we generally hear and see in popular culture is that there's just one interpretation and that is it. That is the word, that's the word of God and everybody has to go by that. But the mm-hmm. fact that there are, in fact, internal differences as well within islam that's all that's very interesting there is there is a reason to it because an average hindu uh, accepts that yes there are different interpretations of hinduism and then they they can all be correct in their own way you know average hindu yeah. accepts that the problem with the muslim community is that nobody accepts it within the community that there can be different interpretations Everybody says that my interpretation is the only one and it is correct. The rest of them are not Islam. That yeah. is why you don't hear it used so usually. Because everybody is yeah. saying there is only one interpretation. But when you look at it, you know, from a distance, you can easily yeah. see that, you know, different countries have their own interpretations. So that is, yeah. that is there. Yeah. You yourself have, you know, you've written a book called The Cosmic Dance. It's uh, so beautifully named and... Uh, it, I have a feeling that it has something to do with the Vedic philosophy. So mm-hmm. would you like to tell us more about it? Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, very briefly, I would uh, just give an introduction what the book is about. Uh, so basically what happened was from, since a young age, I have been uh, writing poetry and I've been pursuing philosophy also. Uh, but at the same time, I was also interested in music. Right. So these, these two different things I was pursuing separately and writing poems. And I was not uh, exposed to the Hindu philosophy uh, by that time. Right. Uh, so, but when I encountered the the works of uh, Adi Shankar Acharya, uh, like Nirvana Ashtakam and other uh, Shri Hari Stotram. So when I, yeah, yeah. So I saw that he has beautifully explained the concepts of philosophy like human consciousness uh, like the science and spirituality and he has done all of that through poetry so i had not i had not seen that anywhere in greek philosophy or you know the the muslim golden age islamic golden age we either see poets or we see scientists we do, we do not see a, a mix mix of both uh, so since I was interested in both, so I was, you know, I was writing raps also and, and all of that. So when I in- encountered that, that got me interested that, you know, what is this? Uh, because young people, my generation, your generation, we are sadly not exposed to our own culture uh, for whatever reason. So growing up, I had no exposure to it. 
but when i encountered i start the more i started to learn then i started reading the vedanta what it is about uh, the advaita vedanta then the what the upanishads have to say so i realized that these are these texts provide an insight into human consciousness and into the universe they they talking about the fundamental forces of nature and how they intera- interact with each other uh, uh, especially after the you know, when we look at the quantum realm the subatomic world we see those things happening in front of our eyes what those people had it written thousands of years ago yeah and you know a lot of people f- uh, find it difficult to understand because it is mind boggling uh, you know they are talking about spand karikas the divine vibration of creation you know yeah. and we are talking about the string theory today says that you know everything uh, all the matter is just vibration and frequencies so yeah so when i was about to publish my book and uh, i was collecting i was writing poems i saw no other name but to uh, give a tribute uh, to this thousands of years old of uh, tradition of science and spirituality and music all woven into one because that's what my the, my poems are about and the cosmic dance basically is nothing but the divine dance of creation like you have mentioned you mentioned in the beginning that cern has a cern uh, has a statue of lord natanj lord natanj yeah so yes. they have understood it why did they put it there because they understood it that there is a connection a between dance. yeah there is uh, because they uh, experiment on the subatomic world and they yeah. understand what the natraj is supposed to uh, mean imply so, yeah imply so that dance that cosmic vibration that that whole journey so it is my tribute uh, to that uh, uh, journey of and i felt connected to it in a very little way that i could and uh, i have i've been traveling a lot in uh, mount kailash and kalpa and rekongpio in those places and i've seen you know the mountains where all these things were conceptualized and they were written down so i felt those things when i went there so i have captured those feelings in my poetry in that book and i would uh, love to uh, you know see if people can uh, read it and uh, see what they have to say about it so i think that is something i would like to see that is so beautiful because uh, you know speaking with you i am reminded of my own journey and how i was uh, how i first got introduced to the vedas and how i started reading and everything that attracted me about the vedanta was the fact that uh, you could actually see what was written playing out in front of your eyes if only you would be open enough to accept it and of course also the fact that uh, once you really get down to reading the texts or the upanishads the vedas then you find that there is no religious element to it as such as we're generally made to believe you know we're so ashamed of yes. the fact that generally while growing up uh, you you don't want to accept the more religious the more staunch elements of your culture but then when i read the texts for myself i saw that there was hardly anything religious about it these uh, texts were talking about like you pointed out very fundamental forces of nature uh, uh in fact like describing say the human body or describing the macrocosm and the microcosm and it's the same for everybody it is universal it is fundamental so yes it 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 left an impact on me as on as well and uh, it's uh, lovely to see that you know it left that kind of an impact on somebody else as well I would love to read a book, and uh, yeah, a final question that you like. This is what my takeaway was. But when you read these texts, then did you feel that they were religious? Like, would you say that the Vedas and the Upanishads are religious texts, so to speak? The basic definition of religion, I would say, is that you know, it it tells you what to do. 
it tells you what to do with life that is what uh, the purpose of a religion is i guess in my opinion i, mean, I don't know if people have different but these texts are not telling you what to do these texts are not a prescription of your reality they are a description of your reality they are descriptive they are not telling you to do something they are telling you how reality is if you understand it if you take it for what it is if you can see it for with your eyes and this tradition of guru shishya tradition what is it saying the guru shishya tradition was that the shishya was uh, the, the guru was saying that i am i am not the final truth i am not i am i'm not telling you to believe something i am pointing at something and i'm helping you to see the reality right so this is the guru shishya tradition so these are not uh, 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 prescription the like 10 commandments telling you you should not do that you should not do this so i would not say in that sense it is a, a religious text i would say these are uh, you know description and also uh, an exploration these are exploration and in nirvanashtakam he says uh, na veda like you don't have to look at uh, the vedas you don't have to look for for the ultimate truth you know the veda is saying the vedas are saying that for ultimate truth neither me yeah neither me nor you uh, neither this world neither the vedas so see look at the uh, the basic uh, how secure and how confident they are they're saying we are only helping you to see reality so a text which says that even i am not final truth how can it be a, a, a religious text so i think there is a lack of understanding once again so i think i hope that you know uh, people understand uh, it a little more and read about it perhaps and because it's for your own good it's not you are not doing anybody any favor it's for your own good if you understand it's it's for your own good Yeah, it does. Nirvana Ashtakam does say na mantra na tirtha na veda na yagya. Yes, it's, it's yes. not mantra. It's no tirthi. You can say na veda na yagna. It's not any of that. But these things can help you reach there. That's these things can help. Yes. Beautiful. Ah, <laughs> uh, I do hope that you know our viewers are able to uh, take away this. Uh, or you know. take things away from our conversation in the same light as uh, we intend for them to uh, as of course you have pointed out adi shankara charya ji's philosophy is uh, you know the vedant that he is referring to that he has written about and and propagated is probably the most subtle form of advait vedant so hopefully our viewers will take it up uh, take away from this discussion in the same way and uh, it's been great to talk to you and uh, i hope that we do connect on such discussions more in future this is lovely lovely absolutely thank thank you for having me and i would also just uh, in the end i would say that our country has a lot of potential and young people especially uh, we have a, a lot uh, to offer to the world Uh, we just have to have a problem solution uh, mindset every problem can have a solution if we have a positive mindset and i would uh, very quickly i would like to talk about the organization i'm associated with uh, it's called yeah. cfps it's an ngo it's yeah. a it's a public policy think tank so we have yeah. conceptualized a, we were talking about lpg cylinders in the beginning right yeah. 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 so just giving an example we have conceptualized a project where we have identified two indian origin scientists and their uh, invention of lpg cook stove one is called agni sumok one is called bpcl uh, the public psu and they have they have invented a cook stove which does only uh, you know fraction of pollution uh, at, uh, compared to average to other cook stoves so we are trying to you know as an organization we are trying to advance indian scientific innovation and also fight climate change and also uh, distribute those uh, cook stove to the poor people so i think these kind of uh, conceptualizing such projects can help 
uh, India make a mark on the global scale also. So I think this kind of potential should be uh, materialized of our youth. So that's what I have to say. Amazing. Uh, I'm sure that you know people are generally they anyway like they like to take away such uh, beautiful uh, concepts from our shows. And uh, thank you for talking about it. Uh, I wasn't aware of it, and I'm glad that I am now aware of it. Thanks to you. So um, thank you, Amir, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again for having me. It's been such a, a wonderful uh, interaction and exchange. And I'm looking forward to uh, having many more. Uh, so that, that has been a learning experience for me also. Uh, I got to know a, a lot more new things. So looking forward to such exchanges more. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.